All right, good stuff tonight. You know, I was planning on going in one direction, and then, um, as happens, you start reading and thinking and praying, and the next thing you know, you're in another direction. We're going to stay in the Gospel of Luke, and I'm going to jump forward to chapter 1. It's the birth of John the Baptist being foretold. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. He had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. And Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be in the sight of the Lord great. And he will drink no wine or liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord. It is he who will go as the forerunner before Jesus in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So what does he say? How will I know this for certain? (laughs) Wrong response. (laughs) I'm an old man. My wife's advanced in years. And the angel said, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And I've been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. And everybody's wondering what's taking him so long, and he comes out and he can't speak, and they realize he had a vision, and he goes home and takes care of business, and John the Baptist is on the way. Amen? 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 So I'm going to talk about this. You know, there's a war on Christmas that's going on. You see it when you go shopping. Happy holidays. Okay. The retailers are trained not to say Merry Christmas. You have to say Happy Holidays because you don't want to offend anybody. Okay. And, you know, we got the nativities being argued in courts and tossed out because, you know, it might offend somebody. And um, there's a war going on. Uh, why do people fight against God? I think he's the only recognized authority over them. And so, I mean, if we didn't believe that he was the authority, we wouldn't be bothering with him, right? Everybody knows deep down in their heart, there's this God person that interferes with us doing whatever we want to do and so guess what happens we pick a fight I think I read a quote today son your arms are too short to box with God okay (laughs) and and here's what's weird the secular word that's world that's waging war on God it's nothing new It's been going on since the beginning of time. I'm talking about the very beginning. The first story we have, basically, in the scripture, Adam and Eve, they're in the garden, and guess what happens? They invite sin into the world. How did it happen? Satan 
who is the original God-hater. He wanted to be God. He caused a war in heaven. He was an awesome being because he got one-third of the angels to fight against God. God tossed him out of heaven. And so God creates a new creation, us, made in his image. And so Satan stabs God in the heart by coming forth and seducing us to rebel against God. To, to encourages us to, to break his rules. And we brought in the knowledge of good and evil. And when you bring evil into the picture, pain, suffering, sin, everything that's bad. So how does God respond? There's this guy named Arrhenius. He was one of the early church fathers. There's the apostle John and one of his disciples that studied under John. Arrhenius studied under that guy. Just so you can see how close he is to the John. His words were, the first gospel is Genesis 3.15. When it says, Satan will strike your heel, but he will crush your head. Okay? This is the curse on the serpent, and it contains a promise. And here's what's amazing. The moment the war on God happened in the garden, immediately the promise was released to us. Immediately. Immediately God had a solution for sin being released into the world. Jesus will crush Satan's head. And that happened on the cross. And here's what you need to know. Christmas is the fact that Jesus set aside his privileges of being part of the Trinity. In Philippians chapter 2, it says he set aside his godhood in order to become like us. Why? Because he came to represent us on the cross. God and man being rectified through the death of Jesus. In, in Matthew chapter 1, he, he came to forgive our sins, it says. Okay? That's why Jesus came to earth. That's what Christmas is all about. That's the Christmas present. Your sins that separate you from God, removed. That's the present. Question is, do you believe this? I ask that question because, you see, Zechariah, he had an opportunity to be, to be part of this drama. He was the priest, and he doesn't have children. Now, this would be a scandal. Um, this would render him an oddity. Having no children in a society, in this society, was perceived as a curse. You need to know that. So a priest doesn't have a, 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 a child. You know, the sideways conversation is, you know, I wonder what sin, wonder what problem, wonder why God doesn't like him. Have you ever had a dream that just didn't come about? How'd you handle that? Sounds like Zacharias handled it beautifully. Righteous and up, up, walking worthy. God's bragging about him. God chose him. Okay. And he gets the biggest call available to the priesthood. He gets to enter the Holy of Holies. No one was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. One priest, once a year. In fact, nobody was allowed to go in, so they would tie a rope around you so that if you went in there and died, they weren't allowed to go get you. They'd pull you out. And what a special place to be. Okay? It's a divine appointment. They would draw straws. Whoever had the biggest straw got to go in. Was it by luck? Or was it a coincidence? Or was it divine choice? Okay? You can decide, is God in charge of your life or not? Or is it just happening to you? Because if it's just happening to you, I feel bad. I said this on Sunday. Somebody said, oh, I'm, I, I worry about everything. I said, hold on a minute. Do you believe in God? Yes. Then you need to know that God will be handling every situation in your life, every problem that comes your way. That doesn't mean he won't allow problems into your life, but he'll turn them into 
positive experiences. Just got to decide, I believe God's involved. And then watch him move all the time. And, and he gets to go into the Holy of Holies. It, you need to know, this is where the ark is. Remember Indiana Jones? <laughs> they stole it from here. The staff of Moses that split the Red Sea, it's in there. A jar of manna, the food that came down every day, in there. The Ten Commandments, in there. I mean, the most sacred things you could imagine in the Holy of Holies. But Zacharias got to see something that nobody else got to see. An angel. He goes in there ready to look at the Ten Commandments, and there's an angel standing there. Not something you see every day. And you need to understand something. Angels aren't those cute little cherubs that the artists draw. Okay? These are big beings. And they're resolute. They fight demons. Okay? And they have a purpose. According to the scriptures, their purpose is to bring salvation to us. To protect us. To serve us spiritually. And the friends that I know that have seen angels, they talk about them being big. I haven't seen any. Friends that I know say they're big. Well, Zechariah sees one of them, and he says, your prayer's been answered. You're going to have a child. And you know what's weird? He's probably thinking, man, that prayer was a long time ago. <laughs> you know, in my 20s and 30s, my 40s, kind of gave up on it in my 50s. I'm now in my 70s, 80s maybe. You're a little late, God. Okay? Being advanced in age, the priest does the, what most of us do. He lets reality get in the way. We got a problem. It's a problem person. They're going to ruin my life. They're going to ruin my job. They're going to ruin everything. And that person goes from being five foot seven to nine foot six. Okay? You have to realize God's at least 10 feet tall. He can handle nine foot six, which, by the way, was the size of Goliath. He says, How can this be? I'm old. How can this be? Now, as a priest, you should have remembered the story of Abraham and Sarah. They were advanced in their years, and they had a child. And by the way, that child started the lineage of God. Then, of course, there's the story of Hannah. She's somebody who can't have a child, and her husband has other wives, and the other wives made fun of her. <laughs> you don't have a child? Ah, you know, too bad for you. Husband likes us more than he likes you. And so she goes to prayer. The priest says, oh, you want a child? God give her a child? Boom, a child comes. But not just any child. Samuel, the prophet. A radical dude. The guy who anoints King David. One that we've talked about in the past that God brags about. Even if Moses and Job and Samuel were here. He's naming off his favorites. Samuel's one of them. And I bring this up because you see, Zechariah is in line of providing a serious prophet in the war against Christmas and evil that goes on. He gets to be part of it. And this is something for all of us to remember. The Bible is not full of stories. It's a manual for how to live the Christian life. These supernatural stories are illustrations of what God can do. And I'm going to go so far to say is they're invitations of how God might move in your life. You know, there's another component to this passage. See, Zechariah has a cosmic calling to be part of the Christmas message. 
He's bringing forth, you know, the Jesus forerunner. He's, he's, he's a big player. They're going to win the battle against evil. And, and guess what? And here's where you get involved. Even insignificant you and me have the same opportunity to let the Christmas message come into and through our lives. You are called into the war against sin and all of its destructive angles. And you can't dismiss yourself saying, well, you know, I'm old. Moses got started at 80. Okay? And besides, your prayers, whew, prayer moves the hand of God. So don't dismiss yourself and say, well, I'm just retired now. No, you're a superior prayer warrior. And we need you. And you can't say, well, I'm just a nobody. Because God has this way of taking ordinary people and doing extraordinary things through them when they say, okay, God, have thine own way. And you might bring somebody to the Lord who has a friend who's got a relative high up, and that message that God gives you goes to them, goes to them, and the next thing you know, God's word is moving powerfully through insignificant me or you. Well, the question is, are you willing to accept this role? Now, an angel might not be the avenue that prompts you, okay? But you can still hear his voice. You can feel his nudge. You can receive an exhortation to be part of the movement. That's why all of you are here. You got nudged. He likes you. He put his hand on your life. It's a whole bunch of people that didn't come here tonight. But you did. Because God has inclined you to come. He's drawn you here. He wants you to have a little bit more of him. And this is a big deal. This is a big deal. Now, you could argue, well, I don't see angels. And I will be honest. There are periods of time when our faith, well, we just know it and we don't experience it. There's dry periods. Okay? We don't see the supernatural. Now, having said that, I, I want to say something clearly. It has been my lifelong experience that when you're engaged in the spiritual journey, and when you're talking to God and you're pursuing His call, answered prayers, sometimes the miraculous, situations get altered because God is the orchestrator of nature. We call it supernatural. He's the one in charge of the natural. And prayer moves the hand of God. And when we're in the God zone and we're trying to bring God's word, God's reality, God's grace, God's, God's healing, His peace, whatever it is, somebody's acting in faith, He responds. Now, Zechariah dismissed the possibility of God moving outside of the normal, natural way of things. But I think what God wanted to do through him was considerably less amazing and miraculous than the way he brought forth Jesus through Mary, the virgin birth. That requires just a little more, wouldn't you say? Um, God introduces himself to Mary. Hi. You're going to have a child. And the Holy Spirit is going to be the one causing it. She says, how can this be? Okay. And, and I wonder, she's marrying somebody from David's line. So it would make sense that possibly something could take place. Because she's, she's marrying into David's line. And, you know, we know what could happen with David's line. You know, I once met a Jew in Los Angeles who was from David's line. And he was a druggie. And everywhere he went, everybody was amazed in the Jewish community. Here was royalty in their world. It's just some druggy musician. Okay, I'm keeping my eyes on you, all right? <laughs> but anyways, David's line. Could, could it be like that? No, because the angel was talking about something big. 
And, and when she says, how can this be? He says, nothing is impossible with God. Now, I don't know what situation you have going on in your world right now, but I want you to know that nothing is impossible. God can move in your prayer. It might not be the way you want. It might not be the timing you want, but he will move because he responds to prayer. And the teenage girl's response was, do unto me according to your will. Now, the question is, why does she get a free pass when Mary questioned the angel, Gabriel, but Zacharias gets punished? Okay? How come? Well, I think when he says, how can I know this for certain? She said, how can this be? How can I know this for certain? See the difference? I'm old. I'm a teenager and I haven't had sex yet. Okay? (laughs) Both have a legitimate question. But he has to say, how can I know this for certain? And that insinuates doubt. And God's not big on doubt. He's against it, actually. And and, while Zacharias is talking to an angel who's named Gabriel, an angel that wars against the demonic realm in Daniel, um, remember that spiritual war that's going on that we see right now happening at Christmas time? Okay? Okay. Well, guess what? Um, this war is, it started off with Noah and the flood. If you remember in Genesis 6, 5, it says that God was sorry that he made man because every thought was evil only continually all the time. Satan had so infiltrated humanity that when it came time for the flood, Noah was the only one. All humanity was evil except for him. And you were lucky if you were happened to be a relative. Okay? So, blessed is a better word. Thank you. So I got two thoughts. Why does God rough up Zacharias? I think mature Christians are expected to get it. All right? Friends, there comes a point when you need to grow up beyond being saved and start being a disciple. That doesn't mean you're not going to get it, still make mistakes, still get it wrong. You'll always be in process. You'll always be learning. There's always another level. You think I've arrived. The moment you say that, three levels appear before you that you've got to start now. And Hebrews talks about you ought to be mature, but you're still babes. It's time to step into the battle. It's time to step into discipleship. It's time to watch God move in and through your life. And by the way, when we say, how can I know this for certain? We immediately miss out on what God can do. When we don't trust him, we don't release our lives to him. We put a lock, a barrier, a wall up, and suddenly, that free will thing, it handcuffs God. And you and I are lucky when he decides not to stand at the door and knock, but kicks it in. Sometimes he kicks it in. Sometimes he'll say, oh, we could have done so much more together. Well, I got an interesting thought for you tonight. In the story, Mary and her baby come to Elizabeth in Zachariah's house. Elizabeth has baby John the Baptist. Mary's got baby Jesus. They come together. Okay? Okay. I wonder if God shut the mouth of Zechariah because he would have gone into preaching mode. Mary, you're not even married yet. I can't believe the way you're behaving. You could get stoned for this. I can't believe the, you're in a priest's house. And all the discouragement and the judgment, and the attitude. I mean, he would stand correct to say all those things. They're in the Bible. But that's because he doesn't know that God's been on the move. And maybe God shut him up so the discourager wouldn't get in there and start to confuse her experience and start to belittle what's going on to release 
hurt and rob her of the joy. Make sure you're not one of those people. I'm telling you, it's so easy to go into lecture mode, so easy to go into righteous mode, so easy to forget grace. Sometimes God's on the move and he seems to move outside of the box. He seems to not have respect for the rules. He seems to stretch us. And if he's stretching somebody, or if somebody's fallen, or if somebody's struggling, maybe God's using that difficult moment as a spiritual shaping. Let's not be discouragers. Let's not rob people of interaction with God. Well, must have been amazing for Zechariah. Mary's chatting away with Elizabeth, and this angel was there. His name was Gabriel. And, and Zacharias, he can't even talk. <laughs> Nothing. You just got to sh- shut up and you don't get to participate. You forfeited that right with your lack of faith. Or again, maybe he kept you quiet so that here's what happens. If you're self-righteous long enough, the only way that grace is going to get into you is if God cuts you off at the knees and forces you to see things through his forgiving lens. Well, not being able to talk, probably enabled him to think. So Gabriel showed up to me and the forerunner of the Messiah, which is in Isaiah 40, And then the Messiah's coming. That's in Isaiah 53. I get to be part of the movement of God. My family gets to be part of the movement of God. Even my cousin. And you know what was said? Jesus, he'll be great. He'll be called Son of the Most High. There will be no end to his kingdom. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. See, Zacharias, he got to be some, part of something special. And, and one more thought. Zacharias, there's a difference between his spiritual experience and Mary's. You see, Zacharias gets a little divine assistance with the natural. A couple of older people share that intimate moment. Okay. Um, Mary, it's supernatural. Doesn't happen. Zacharias, it's the best that human righteousness can achieve. Mary, it's Holy Spirit anointed. Zacharias brings John the Baptist. I tell you that all the prophets before were not as great as John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than him. The best spiritual world can bring is nothing compared to when the Holy Spirit's around. And friends, that brings it around to you and me. We have the Holy Spirit. This is the Christmas gift. Listen, we talked about this in Luke 11. When Jesus said, he's talking about giving gifts. He said, if you then, even though you're evil, that you have the taint of sin, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to him who asks? What's the gift that he gives? The Holy Spirit. And let me define that for you. The presence of God with you at all times. That's the Christmas gift. And that's what God wants you to see and experience. That's why Jesus came to earth. You no longer have to be dominated by sin. There's a new future, a new hope, a new lifestyle available for you. So, are you expecting anything from God? Do you believe he can do something special in and through you? 
Don't be a Zechariah. Be a Mary. That childlike faith. Be it done to me according to your will. This Christmas, let's look for ways that God can break into and through our lives. Amen?